Hello and you're very welcome to Heart to Heart. This is a vodcast from your local charity, Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke. I'm delighted to be hosting this series of, I suppose, video interviews where we meet survivors, friends, supporters of people who have had heart conditions, chest conditions, all kinds of different conditions. And it's so important that we can hear these stories and we're delighted to be able to share them with you. Real life experiences matter. And if you're watching this today and perhaps you've been through the same thing, we hope that they help you. We'll also be telling you more about what Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke can do to help and support you. Well, today, we're talking all about women and heart disease. And I'm joined on the sofa uh, by Julie McAllister. And Julie, you are a survivor of a heart attack of a certain type. We'll be hearing more about that in a minute. And Julie, you've also brought your lovely husband, Derek, along because whatever has affected you has also affected Derek and the entire family. And we're really pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Carol Wilson, a retired cardiologist and board member for Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke. So, Julie, I suppose it's it's obvious that we that we start with you. Um, I couldn't believe it uh, when I was reading about what happened to you. You were 39 years old when you had a heart attack. I know you probably get asked about it and maybe going back to 2012 is a difficult thing to do, but could you tell us, talk us through what actually happened? Yeah, well, it was a Saturday morning and I was going to a Thai bow class in the local community centre. Um, so I left at half eight, made my way up the, it's only a short distance to the community centre, um, started the class at nine o'clock. Um, I was only in the class 10 minutes doing warm up and some, some kicks, back kicks, when I felt very sick. I've never felt sick before at an exercise class. So I walked over to where my bag was and got a bottle of water. But by the time I got over there, I felt pain in my chest um, and it frightened me. So I lifted my bag and walked out into the reception area where I used my phone to phone my husband, Derek, um, and said, you need to come up and get me right away. There's something wrong, I'm not well. So by the time Derek arrived down, I had pains in my arms, down both arms, um, and I was very clammy and I could feel that my breathing felt like I was struggling to get a breath in. Um, so Derek brought me down to the house and I said, ring an ambulance. So he rang 999 and was on the phone and my oldest daughter came down and sat with me while I was on the settee. I was, it just felt like I had a, a weight, like a heavy weight on my chest. And did you think heart attack? I did. I just thought there's, there's just something not right. This has to be my heart because I have, haven't had any symptoms days before or anything, chest pain. Um, so I could hear my husband telling me to slow my breathing down. The girl on the phone was telling him tell her to slow her breathing down, but I just couldn't. No, because you're in a state of panic as well. I was gasped, I felt my hands were all clammy. My daughter was holding my hand. Um, and then the rapid response paramedic arrived in, um, told me to slow my breathing down. He gave, gave me aspirin. Um, and he hooked me up to the leads for the ECG, but I was so clammy that they weren't sticking properly to me. And he just tried to reassure me and he said, look, this is this will not be your heart, just calm down. This might just be muscles, pulled muscle because you were at an exercise class. I just kept saying, no, no, this, I, I, there's something wrong. There's something wrong with me. I, I feel like I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to die. So um, another ambulance was called to take me to Antrim Hospital. So on the way up there, um, we had to actually stop because they ran out of, the cylinder ran out of gas and air. Um, and I thought, I'm not going to make it here. I'm going to going to die in the ambulance. But they were they were very reassuring. They told me that everything was going to be OK and they'd look after me. Derek was in the ambulance with me. Um, and then we got the Antrim and the paramedic, female paramedic says, we're going to put you in here to the miners area um, and you might be here a while. So we're going to get you an extra mattress for the trolley. So I thought, oh well, if goodness. I'm going to be left here, I'm going to die here. So I was behind the curtain with my husband and I heard a, a nurse that I worked with in White Abbey. Um, her name was Carol, so I told Derek to shout for her. And Carol came in, pulled the curtain and said, what's happened? And I said, please get me help. I uh, Please, I'm in so much pain. 
I was literally crawling up the bed because I was in so much pain in my chest. So she went through and the next minute uh, I was brought through to another area in a and &E. um, Bloods were taken, IV paracetamol was put up, an ECG was taken. Um, I can't remember how long I was there for. Derek would probably be able to tell, say how long I was there for, but it didn't seem very long to me that I was in A&E. Um, and they came and told me that I'd had a heart attack and they were moving me to coronary care. So I was moved down the corridor um, into a room and hooked up to a telemetry machine. Um, Derek was there, the doctor says that she'd more than likely be sent to, on Monday morning to the cath lab for um, an angiogram. Um, so Derek was told it was okay to go on home, so he went on home to see the children. My mum and dad were there. Um, a young nurse came in and asked did I want any tea or coffee and I said I'd have a cup of tea because I hadn't had anything to eat or drink from the, really the night before. Um, I did feel okay because the paracetamol they had given me and um, morphine I think was another drug that they'd given me. I did feel okay um, but within maybe half an hour I had more chest pain and I'm not sure whether it was probably shown up on the telemetry that I was having more chest pain and the doctor came in and said no you're so unstable now we're going to take you to the cath lab straight away. So I was put in. I remember being wheeled back up the corridor past A&E and some of the girls that were there just looking at in horror and thinking, oh my goodness, this young woman must be in big problems here, yeah. So I was put into the back of the ambulance and I was transferred to the Royal. I don't remember very much of it, I just remember sirens um, and opening my eyes and hearing the paramedics saying, you're gonna be okay. And some of it is blank. I just remember waking up then again in the cath lab to Dr. Richardson. And he asked me, did I have high cholesterol? I said, I'm not aware of it. And he just said that I had, I'm not sure of the name. Samsalasma, yeah. On my eyelids. Um, and he said, look, we're gonna do our best here to see what's going on. So an angiogram was performed and they told me that I had a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And, um, that I needed to go for to have an emergency triple bypass to save my life. That spontaneous coronary artery dissection, had you ever heard no. of that before? And it's a type of heart attack? Yeah. Um, we'll probably discuss yeah. that yeah. more with the cardiologist in a minute, but what do you understand? Um, I just, the way I was told was the artery had just started to dissect, so the blood wasn't able to flow. So that is what's caused the clot then that causes the heart attack. Mm -hmm. That's just what I was told, that there was, the blood wasn't able to flow. Um, and that's why they needed to go in that part of the heart. Um, the blood wasn't able to go, go through those arteries. So then that's why they perform the bypass to put in the new, it's a vein from your leg. Oh my goodness. So you got up that morning to go to an exercise class, a perfectly fit, healthy, young mum of four children um, and at this stage you're you're barely conscious thinking is this it yeah can you even think what was going through your head at the time or were you too poorly I just thought that when the doctor came and said this is the consent form you need to sign this consent form you're you're going to have to have an emergency triple bypass I just thought to myself that's for an old person <laughs> I'm not even 40 um, and they just said, you need to sign this, we need to go, we need to go now. And I just thought, this is a, my family was there, my mum and dad and my, my sisters were there and my husband wasn't. He was still at home, he hadn't been contacted because they thought he was already there. And what did you do? Did you say, contact my husband? I just said, um, my husband's not here and they said, well, we can't wait. This is an emergency, you need to go. But my sister had rang and told Derek, look, you need to come straight away, try and get up as fast as you can, safely. Um, and we waited for another wee bit and my mum and dad were there and they came over and kissed me and my mum said, um, you're going to be, sorry. I know your mum's no longer yeah, with us. My mum's passed away, yes. Um, she said, you're going to be fine. <laughs> you're going to be fine. You'll be here. You'll come out the other side. We'll be waiting on you. And she kissed me and the doctor said, we have to go, sorry. It's time to go. So um, I said, tell Derek and the kids that I love them. Yeah. And um, I was transferred out onto the corridor to take us up. 
And um, it was only when we got to the lift that um, someone shouted, that's her husband. He's coming now. So my husband and my oldest daughter, Gemma, were allowed to travel in the lift up to theatres. And he left me at the theatre door and he said, I'll see you. I'll see you later. Didn't you? <laughs> no. The scariest moment of your life, I'm sure. And um, Derek, so you've had quite a day at this point already. But, you know, a few hours before you thought maybe, yes, this is terrible, but she's in Antrim, she's fine. I'll go home and reassure the kids. Yeah, her parents, I, with, this was after her parents arrived. I went home. Yeah. One of the hardest parts was having the phone her mum and dad. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> tell them that she was having a heart attack. And then they couldn't believe it. I'm sure they couldn't their child. <laughs> and then trying to explain to the kids what was happening. And what you don't really know yourself. No. no. Is that not what it's been like, you know, all the way throughout? It's there's so much of an unknown, but your attention and focus was at this stage. Yeah. You know, all on Julie. Yeah, what was what was it like at the lift doors when you saw her? Hard because they said you had a fifty fifty chance at living. Hmm. That's where you're going to see her again. Such a shock for both of you. Um, what happened next, Julie? Well, I was took into the cath lab and, or sorry, into theatres. And I just remember looking over and seeing the bypass machine and thinking, oh my word, <laughs> what's that big machine? <laughs> um, and there was a young anaesthetist and I thought I'd recognised him from working in um, Antrim Hospital. But so you were a nurse? I'm a health care assistant, health care yes, in the day surgery unit in Antrim. Um, and I thought I'd recognised him and he chatted away. And um, then this other uh, female anaesthetist, it was probably his boss, <laughs> she came along and said, right, um, Julie, we're going to have to put a central line in. So um, we just need you to look over to the left. And that was the last I remember. I don't remember anything else from then. Um, and meanwhile, Derek, where were you? We were in a room down in the sort of old building, as it was classed, and Waiting. just down from the, the theatre. So we were allowed to stay there, lovely enough. And then the surgeon would send somebody out every so often. Just so how long were you waiting? Well, the, they said 12 hours she would be there, so I couldn't honestly tell you actually how long we were there, but it was the middle of the night before they came and told us that she was in ICU then. So you breathed a sigh of relief at that point, a little one? Well, a little one because sure they told her it's the next 12 hours or whatever was critical. critical. Have you any recollection of any of this? Um, I remember waking up a few times, just opening my eyes. I seen Derek was the first person I seen. Um, and then I seen my mum and dad and then my oldest daughter, Gemma, um, and the nurses who were looking after me. But not very much. I don't remember very much of being in ICU. I just remember my daughter crying. And I think it was the first time she'd seen me. and. One of my sisters who hadn't made it up to the hospital before I went to the cath lab. So um, she only arrived in when I was in theatre. So she hadn't seen me. So whenever she came to see me in, in ICU, she was quite shocked with all the machines and the colour of me. I think it was the colour of me that got her. She, she says she, she looks like she's dead. That's all she kept saying. And they were like, no, she's not. She's, she's fine. I remember that. Terrifying, terrifying for everybody and everybody that loved you and terrifying for you. But, you know, maybe at that point you were on enough medication not to know so much, but a huge operation yeah. as well. We'll come back to what happened after that. I mean, you're here today and that's what, at this point, 11 years ago, is it? No, nah, it's nine. Nine, sorry, can't, never good at maths, but nine, nine years, years ago. So you are a survivor. You did survive, but I suppose it'd be really good to bring uh, Carolyn, now Dr. Carol Wilson, of course, retired cardiologist, but you were nodding all the way through that. 
Um, I had never heard of a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. Julie hadn't knows everything about it now, of course, but how common was this to happen to someone so young? So the majority of people who have a heart attack is because they develop a clot in the heart artery. But there's a small proportion of patients that there are other mechanisms come into play. And of those, a spontaneous dissection is one of them, and particularly in younger women. Why? Mostly, we don't know the reason. There are some associations, there's such associations with the oral contraceptive pill, with certain tissue disorders, but in the majority of patients, there is no known precipitating factor. And I think you probably were, were, what were, one, of, what were one of those, really. Well, the fact that you're nodding and saying, well, actually, you know, it is more common in young women, but yet Julie's reception in A&E, &E, I still think there's that incredulity that somebody so young could be yes. having a heart attack yes. or something yes. of this yes. nature. And that's why it's very important. The, the story that she tells, you could write the textbook on having a heart attack, actually. Right? Your symptoms how it started with the sort of feeling of nausea and unwell and the pain and this just feeling that something terrible was going on. Um, absolutely classical story. But having said that, not every patient presents with the classical symptoms. You had the nausea, the pain, the clamminess. Patients don't always have all those symptoms, which why is why it's very important that, you know, when a doctor or a health professional is talking to a patient, that they really listen to what they have to say. And I think one of the important things about what you've told us is that this was out of the ordinary for you. You're not the sort of lady who had vague things happening to you now and then. This was completely out of the blue, completely out of what was normal for you. And that's very powerful and means, yes, there must be something going on in this lady, regardless of her young age. And, you know, as with other uh, chest, heart, stroke conditions, is time of the essence? So when it comes to a heart attack, as you have described, that is the one case where time is really of the essence, really which is why I'm glad that you were seen early by the, the par paramedics and taken to hospital. The one thing I maybe would say is that if you do a cardiograph very early when someone's having a heart attack, it may not show too much. And that is why probably when you had further pain, um, they probably looked at the cardiograph again. So, and then it was absolutely clear what was happening and to you And what are you time. looking for in the cardiograph? So, we, you have what we call a normal pattern, which hopefully yours and mine looks like, fingers crossed. And there are some changes. There are different types of heart attack, but in the type of heart attack you are having, the, it, the ECG probably showed what we call ST elevation. And it's just a pattern that you see and you recognize on an ECG. And that's the pattern that really means right into the ambulance and up the road to your nearest cath lab. Now, you said that some people don't present with the with the obvious signs of a heart attack that we know and the pain and the chest pain and the the pains down the arms um if anybody had any concerns at all um what should they do because we're talking today not only about heart attacks but heart disease that's different but what would you be saying to people at home to be to be on the lookout for or anything they can do i suppose to try and prevent something yes, like this so, yeah so i think you've, you're coming at it from the right direction there i think as a community, we should all be very much more into the prevention end. And you can never reduce your risk to zero, but you should, we all, I say you should, we should, I should be reducing my risk of developing heart disease to the lowest possible. And that is really things that I suppose we all know, but don't always practice really. You know, we all should be looking at our diet and what we're eating. We should be looking at our weight um, we should be looking at the amount of exercise that we do or don't do. And then there are things that also you might need your doctor to have your blood pressure checked, although there are other ways of having your blood pressure checked, such as to this chest, heart and stroke, um, having your cholesterol checked. So you can get these done at chest, heart and stroke as well, right, instead of having to go they, to the they GP? can, yes, or your GP can do them or not. You don't, may not even need to see the GP, often the practice nurse. Uh, can, can carry out these checks. So we should always start from the preventative end and reducing our risk down to the lowest possible. So prevention, um, but again, Julie, we, how, yes, we know you were into exercise. How was your diet? How was all of the other things there that Carol was mentioning? Well, I, I was a smoker. 
Ah, so how could I forget? Oh, we forgot the cigarettes. How could I forget the cigarettes? So, so many of us, I suppose, <laughs> ha no now, not two, but back in 2012, maybe that message hadn't yeah. really. I was a smoker um, and I did have a healthy diet. I wasn't big on fried fruit, food, or I, I would have had salads quite a, a good bit. Did a lot of walking and playing with the children, you know, exercising with the children, playing football and stuff. So I never really, I never really seen myself as being unfit and ready to have a heart attack, you know, even my BMI. We, we did a, a wee clinic in White Abbey Hospital where I was and they would have went up and done your blood pressure for you and your weight and I was, my BMI was always low, you know, I didn't have a high BMI. So when this happened and my husband had to contact the girls I work with in White Abbey, um, total shock, even doctors were like, big tall Julie, you know, thin girl. We're like, yeah, just couldn't believe it, couldn't believe did, it. Derek, did you smoke? Yeah. And did you stop as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's another conversation. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to say yes, because normally I think it's very important if one partner is a smoker and stops, I think it's very important that the other partner and perhaps the rest of the family all, all try and give up as well. Probably a really stressful time to... Yes, I know, and he'll keep trying, won't you, Derek? Yes, it's all right. Very important. Okay, so the last time we were talking to you, you were you just had a triple bypass. We were still in that critical stage of the next 12 hours. Um, what happened then? Well, I don't really remember much of being in ICU. I do remember now, um, I think I was, Derek was there and a wee gentleman in the next bed had become ill. Um, and if they do need to open you again, they open you in ICU. So um, I think it was going to be coming to that. So they'd asked my family to leave because they needed to perform whatever they needed to do. So I remember that, but I remember I went to sleep quite quickly. So I think I was still a, a lot of drugs that I was being given to keep me stable and stuff. So I remember that. And then the next day, I think it was the Wednesday, um, I was moved into the high dependency and they got me out onto a chair, which was the, the most, well, this, my surgery was on the Saturday. I was in IC, ICU until the Wednesday. So then they moved me into the high dependency, but I remember them getting me out on a chair and it was the most awfulest feeling sitting out in the chair. Still felt that I couldn't breathe. Um, my leg was sore. My chest wasn't really sore, but it was mainly my leg that was sore. Um, so why was that? Explain why that was. So they take the graft, they take a vein from, so they took a vein from here to here, and then um, I have another vein from here into my groin. So this leg was black and blue from working with me and probably all the blood thinners that they give you, you know, so bruising. Um, but it was my leg that, kicked, that was the most sore. And I developed a, a big hematoma just at the top here. So I had quite a big hard, lump on my leg. They thought they were going to have to take me back to theatre to remove it, but um, it all dispersed itself. Um, and I remember my friend coming to see me and I just said, could you tell them to put me back into bed? <laughs> I just I just felt so weak. I think I was only out on the chair for about an hour, but I just felt so weak. I just wanted back into bed. And then on the Thursday, I was transferred round to the coronary ward um, where I was in a bed of six six patients and I was the youngest. They were all um, in their 70s that all had triple bypasses. But you were going the right direction and quickly, which was which was really positive. Derek, you must have been so relieved. Yeah. Still yeah. in shock though, I'm sure too. I think it was, was it day five they call it? Day five, yeah. That's when you're sick? I became sick, yeah. Not sick with the heart, just um, I think all the medication. Is that yeah. common then? Very common. Right. There's a very classical textbook. Sto textbook story, even down to the fact that it's often the leg wound patients find much more discomfort with that than the chest wound, and that, that's extremely common. When you think you're opened all the way down, it must be awful. I, I can't even imagine what that's like. And then, you know, and then even looking at what's happened to your body, even having to look at yourself, is that difficult? Yeah, I hadn't really seen myself until probably the Thursday then when I went round to the cardiac ward. Um, and I was brought in to have a shower. The nurse brought me into the bathroom to have a shower and 
just looking at myself in the mirror. I just didn't look like myself. Did you want to see yourself? I did. I did want to look at myself and there was a bit of a shock, you know. I was expecting to have a big sticky plaster, you know, right down my chest. Didn't have no, there's no, they don't put dressings on. Um, so I had a look at my wounds and I had a look at my leg and I was a bit tearful when I seen my scars, you know. Couldn't believe what you'd been through. Yeah. Okay, you're also these young children at that stage, what your daughter was, your eldest was 16, then you've twin boys at 10 and a little one of three. Where did, I mean, obviously you said your, your daughter was there, but what about the, were they all worried sick or how did you protect them? Or Derek probably had that duty or your parents. G Gemma came up, the, he brought the boys up. Yeah. And then they said, no, no they wouldn't. They don't want to see me. And the girls took one like that and she cried. She, she cried. She wanted to go home. So she did. So, but Derek just reassured me every day that the kids were they were okay. They were doing okay. Family members were over making sure that they were okay and seeing to them. But it was always, you know, at the back of your mind. It's been a very traumatic time for them. You know what way will it affect them? You know. And then harder. you're trying to get you're trying to get better, but you're. Try, trying to stay strong for them as well because it must have been very frightening. It was frightening. harder more for the, the younger one because she couldn't get lifted and no. things like that there. And she Where's your mummy gone? Yeah, we're hugs and things like that there. Yeah. And you were saying to me before we sat down to do the interview um, that that's something you'd like to highlight, you know, that maybe there needs to be more support for families. Again, maybe all the services are geared towards the individual and maybe an older person, but there were so many people dependent on you that, mm -hmm. and the children were so vulnerable. Yeah, where Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke would give a lot of support to families. Um, that was one of the things that I learned whenever I became an ambassador for them and spoke a, a lot with the, the staff from there. And they said, we would have given you so much support when this happened, they do, they do come out to see you at the house and, you know, um, that was the biggest thing was I was worried about Derek, you know, how does how does he feel about seeing his wife, you know, almost dying and there was no support for him. But that's that's what they really need. They need support for families. But that support is there. Yep. Okay, so how helpful were Northern Ireland Chest Heart and Stroke to you and your family? Well they're very supportive now. now. Yep. Now you know. Yep, now I know. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Anything that I would need at all, I know, I just have to lift the phone. Um, if I was worried about my blood pressure and wasn't able to get to the GP or cholesterol, I know that I could ask them for that support and I know that I would always get it. From them. So how have you been since? Have, have you had any other setbacks or blips or what's life been like since? The first few years now, um, sort of, I had a bit of dizziness and I wasn't well in work and I had to go to the, the Royal but it was just medication, it was too much. Um, it, was too, it was too high, the, the amount that it was getting was too high for me. So they just reduced it. Um, I had a wee bit of chest pain when I was out walking one day and that was quickly fixed in the hospital. They sent me for another big test of, on my heart, uh, myocardial perfusion, um, and they said everything was okay. So touch wood, <laughs> I get checked at the, um, the Royal, I'm under Dr. Dixon. She's a um, heart failure doctor in the Royal, so that's who looks after me now. I don't see a cardiologist. Um, I was under a cardiologist um, until about three years ago, and then they transferred me over to the heart failure team. And Carol, just explain that for us now. You talked about the heart failure. Um, is somebody like Julie always going to have, to have that if, if they've had that massive damage to their heart? Is it something you live with? So often when you have a heart attack, you're left with some damage to the heart and that can be very variable in, in degree really. And uh, often the terms we use around this are very imprecise, I have to say, and heart failure it, itself is a very imprecise term. But we do know that with being on the right medications and the right doses and not too high a dose either, that patients can have an extremely good quality of life and an extremely good 
outcome long term and that's what we're looking for we're not just looking for how you are now but we're trying to protect and look after your future well-being and your your future health really and that's why um you're clearly being very well looked after by dr dixon who's a heart failure cardiologist okay so you can live a full life yes. but maybe always in the back of your mind of course you yes. never you never these things never quite leave your mind and no. they probably surface at odd and strange times really that sort of way but we do know that with the right treatment that the outlook for patients who have damaged hearts regardless of the cause of the damage to the heart whether it's a heart attack or some other way that their outcome with proper care proper medication looking after their own general health, that their outcome is much better than it was perhaps even 15 years ago. So again, if there's somebody that's watching this and perhaps there's somebody who's maybe recently been through something similar, um, what, what would you say to that person right now who's maybe thinking, I can't believe, I'm in that state of, I can't believe this happened to me? Yeah, so there are several things. One is that I suppose as doctors, we're not always desperately good at explaining to the patients exactly what has happened to them and then not very good at explaining what they can expect in the future. Now you can't predict the future you know but um, I think it's sometimes useful for patients to know what they might expect in the future so that they're not always thinking oh, is this about to happen to me again you know can I ever you know go back to exercise classes or whatever you enjoy doing. So very important and as I say, we, we, I think as health professionals, we've got something to learn in that. I think getting support from a charity like Chest, Heart and Stroke is very important because they often bring a slightly different perspective from what you purely get from a health professional. And they often, there are often questions that you want to ask your doctor, but you think, oh, that's a stupid question. I don't really want to ask them that. But chest, heart and stroke, they've seen it before. They know what the answer is. And if they don't know what the answer is, they know where to signpost you to, to get the answer, really. And is it very important for you to be a board member? Well, uh, yes. Um, I have been redoing really this for a couple of years, but I must say what I've learned in the last couple of years is absolutely amazing. And I think it is fair to say that before I became a board member, I had relatively little concept of what exactly chest, heart and stroke did on a day-to-day -day basis and what they did for patients really and the, enthu and the enthusiasm with which they do it. Sorry, you and, sorry I, I talked over the top of you there. What have you been most impressed by what they offer? Um, the personal re relationship that they develop with their, whether you call them patients or clients or whatever you were to call it, I think it's that and also that they engender this feeling that no matter what the query is, no matter what the worry is, they can be contacted. And I think that is so important that patients are not left thinking, I have to wait till my next doctor's appointment or whatever to ask this. They can ask it, be reassured or be signposted to where they need to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, doctors are so busy, but you're at the kind of the, the emergency end and then the, the appointments end, but it's the care that's so, needed. Yeah, so where, where the, the health service is, is not bad at providing emergency care when things are really bad as, as what happened to you but where it perhaps falls down or maybe doesn't have the resources is in that type of more long-term after care and the reassurance that a patient needs that they're on the right track um, and that you know there is a life after whatever the event is and that's I think where chest heart and stroke do so well. Well, let's actually ask you, Julie, because you've become an ambassador for, for Northern Ireland Chest Start and Stroke. In fact, you ran their amazing red dress run, or you walked. walked. But you know, even that was incredible. <laughs> you did 10K in a freezing cold February mm -hmm. and raised money for this charity. Why? Well, I think they just do amazing work to start with. Everything that they do for people with chest, heart, and people who have had strokes. Um, I just wanted to do the red dress run so I could show that there is uh, a life after having a heart attack and to show some awareness. Derek, you were very proud of her, that red dress run. Tell us, tell us what it was like when you saw her crossing the finish line. Oh, it was great. We were all standing, waiting to cheer her coming through the finishing line. 
even though they were starting to pack up. <laughs> <laughs> you got there in the end. We got there in the end. Mm. It's been quite an ordeal for you all. And even today, just taking the time to reflect back on what you've been through, I suppose, as a, as a couple as well. I'm sure it was a real test of your relationship at times. And what's life like now, Derek? Well, oh, it's fine, so it is. Not that we see much of each other. <laughs> That's the secret of a great marriage. No, Are I you busy? I work night shifts, so oh. Ryan coming in, she's going out. So. Ships in the night. But then when you're working night shift, you're always in, it's always in the back of your mind too. That she's maybe in the house on her own with the daughter. What happens? And it has been a, wor a worry and a concern for the children as well, I suppose, to have gone through what they did with, with you and then think, what would I do if something like that happened again? Um, but they're great kids. Yeah, that was, that was a worry when I got back on my feet if when I was going out maybe into Carrick with the wee, wee one, that if I collapsed in the street, who would, who would be there to look after? That was a, a big concern, but over the years, you've, uh, that's all gone, you know. If you have to, you have to kind of wake it on and put it to the back of your mind and not think about it every day, because it was in my mind every day, constantly, for a good year and a half. Um, just constantly thinking about it, is it going to happen again? You know, your person, my personality changed. I did, I did, um, I did become a grouch for a while. Is it any wonder? <laughs> yeah, and you your do. confidence. Yeah, knocked. Oh, knocked. Yeah, didn't really want to go out with friends or anything. And if I was going to work in the train, I could sit in the train and look round and think, how many people on this train know CPR? You know, if I collapse on the train, that, that, that was for a good year and a half that went through my mind, if I was out. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I, and that in itself then leads to anxiety, leads to you feeling awful. Um, yeah. And then you think, is this it again? Or, yeah. yeah. Any wee thing, even if you were nervous about something and maybe your heart would race, you're thinking, oh, is this racing for a reason? Or is it just racing because I'm anxious about something or am I going to have another heart attack? And how do you deal with that anxiety and that lo loss of confidence if people are watching this and they say, that's exactly where I am now? Well, you just, well, the way I look at it is uh, if I'm not having any pain, the doctors always said to me, the minute you have pain, the way you had pain that day, you do not wait for anybody. You lift the phone and you ring 999. So if I have a wee niggly pain and it lasts for more than 10 minutes, then I'll then I maybe phone the GP and say, look, I'm having a wee bit of a niggly pain. I'm not sure what it is. Could I make an appointment to see you? Um, but other other times, if yeah, if I am anxious about going out somewhere and I'm thinking, just calm down. It's you know, it's nothing to worry about. You're just anxious about going to do this or going to do that or starting a new job. Maybe because I we moved from day surgery in White Abbey to day surgery in Antrim. Um, and I was a wee bit anxious about mo moving into bigger surgery and... Going back to Antrim as well. Mm. Going back and yeah. diff different staff, working with different staff. But other than that, I just take each day as it comes now. I just take a deep breath and just get on with it. And the fact that you've gone back to work and you're con continuing to help others in the healthcare system, is that important to you? It is too. And a couple of years after it happened, uh, I was looking after a wee gentleman and he had had the same surgery as me and, and I chatted with him and I said, oh, I've had that surgery. And he was like, well, I've had mine 25 years now. And I was like, well, I hope I get to 25 years with mine, you know, because they do say they probably would need further surgery in the future. So uh, I always think, well, if that's the time they give you, then I'll be 65. I could make it to, if I make it to 65, I'll doing well I'm sure you, you know will. I hope you will of yeah. course and um, the talking with others who've been through it how important is that and the support that you get from each other well it, it is really good because then when you see how well they've came on and I do look at myself now and I think well it's nine years and I think I've done really well I haven't touched wood I haven't had to need any more further surgery I haven't had any pain the way I had that day I'm on my medication that's regularly checked you know Stay positive. Stay positive. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it's all about is the mindset. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You just go on and 
If you think there's something wrong, go and get checked out. That's a great message. Absolutely. You have to go with your gut. Mm -hmm. That was my gut that day that told me that something this was just wasn't wrong. this just wasn't a pulled muscle. It was the it was this feeling, a terrible feeling that I had that I knew that I needed to get home. And I think even with Derek, when he seen the look on my face and the colour of me, then he knew that there was definitely something wrong because I was never I was never sick. Mm -hmm. I was never ill, I wasn't, wasn't back and forth to the doctor or anything, I just, I was, I thought I was fit and healthy, you know. You just never know what's around the corner, no. do you? But um, thankfully you're here to tell us about it today and to help others um, who've maybe been through the same thing. And thank you for sharing the story, Derek. Thank you to you as well for everything that you've done to look after Julie and your family. It's a, it's an amazing, um, no. Exactly. So thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Carol Wilson, thank you very much as well for coming in and, and, and shedding some light on the fact that, you know, this does happen and it does happen to younger people as well. But absolutely, you're not alone. Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke is here for you too to answer all of those questions. And there are lots of questions. That's the main thing, isn't it? Can I just say one more, more thing? It's a, so um, g getting over having bypass surgery, there, there are two elements to it. There's the physical end of it. And uh, OK, the leg was a problem. But actually, a lot of patients find that the psychological is much more difficult to get over. That, and it's the fact that it happened to you so quickly out of the blue, you didn't have time to prepare, your family didn't have time to prepare. And what you describe is, is really very classical as well, that psychologically it takes you rather longer to get over the effects of it than it does the physical effects of it. I would imagine it's nearly like a post-traumatic stress thing. Yeah, you know. I think, you know, sometimes if people have had problems with their heart and they have went and had an angiogram and they've said, oh, you're gonna need surgery, but we're not going to do it right now. We're giving you some, maybe a stent or something um, and give you time to prepare. But as you say, I didn't have any time. It shock. was just shock. Yeah, just there. I'm in theatre. I know, my goodness, am I going to come through it? You know, all those things were going through my, through my mind. And then you do come through and then you think, why did I come through and yeah. what if I didn't? And yeah, and then you, you sort of think to yourself, well, why did it happen to me? That's one of the big things that I kept saying. Why did it happen to me? Why did it not happen to that person? I know that's very, probably very selfish and, you know, saying, well, why did it happen to her? Um, I think it's really honest and it's probably what every single person yeah, absolutely. thinks. Absolutely. You know, why me? It's, and it's not fair either, is it, sometimes? And sometimes after it as well, I, I felt like um, my memory I've had, I have terrible problems with my memory. That, that's common yeah. after being on a bypass machine. Um, a lot of patients describe that. Yeah, it was one of my friends, um, she'd had a wee grandson and I just couldn't remember his name and it just was so upsetting that I just couldn't remember his name and I said to Derek, go on to Facebook and go on to her, pitch, her profile there and see if his name's there and I want to know what it is. It just, it was so upsetting. Uh, that I just couldn't remember things and even now I don't remember a lot of people that I went to school with. I think you're being very hard on yourself and I think a lot of people would understand and it's okay but you know Carol raised a really good point there it is often the psychological um, and that's as important as fixing yourself physically you must go and talk to somebody and know that you're not alone with those thoughts either yeah. so they're very common so thank you for raising that and again Northern Ireland Chest, Heart and Stroke are there to help with that. Okay, well, we're going to wrap it up for now, but thank you so much for taking part in our vodcast. Um, our next episode, we're going to be talking to all kinds of different survivors who have stepped up to a challenge to give something back, which seems very um, common too, that when you've been through something, you want to give something back. So that's our next episode. We'll see you next time. <laughs>